This is the notebook where I've written down every single book I've read since January of 2018. And in between January of 2018 and the time of this recording, and I'm recording this on February 12th, 2023, I've read 290 books. That's roughly a book a week. But I don't love this notebook because of the numbers. In fact, I don't write the numbers down in the notebook. I love it because it tells a story. It is the story of me. I wanted to make a video about some of the books that I wrote down in this journal. The books that if you kind of put them together in chronological order, they sort of tell the story of who I was. The first one is The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin, which I read in early 2018. This book is a masterpiece. It is perfect science fiction. It is deeply philosophical. Um, the subtitle of the book is An Ambiguous Utopia, and I think this really highlights one of Le Guin's great strengths, which is the ambiguity of some of her works, that Le Guin doesn't give you those easy answers. Instead, she gives you a difficult question, and just when you think you might get an answer, you get a more difficult question in its place. The Dispossessed was the first novel by Le Guin that I read. I have now read, I think, almost every Le Guin novel. I'm sure there's a few I haven't, and I'd like to dive more into her short stories because I've only read a few of those. Few writers have impacted me like Le Guin. She changed what I was interested in in literature. She also changed what I was interested in in philosophy. So it was like all of my interests were converging in this beautiful way, and it was Le Guin who got me to see that. I had never been interested in political philosophy before, and then I read The Dispossessed. But I also had kind of had this view that science fiction was escapist. And it turns out I was totally wrong. Le Guin proved me wrong twice over. So in 2018, I also read The Greatest Book of All Time, which is Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Depending on the day, I would either say that Fyodor Dostoevsky is my favorite writer or Le Guin is my favorite writer. I think I love more of Le Guin's books, but Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment just is the perfect novel. It is a novel that has stuck with me, that haunts me. And because of the strength of just Crime and Punishment alone, it would make him a contender to be my favorite author. I decided to read Crime and Punishment at the time because I was looking for difficult novels. I picked it because it was long, because it was a classic, because it was Russian, because when I was getting back into reading for pleasure around this time, I was really only reading science fiction or fantasy books. This really changed the shape of my life. Um, it became a huge passion of mine was reading these classic novels. I became very interested in the concept of the Western canon. Without Crime and Punishment, I wouldn't have this YouTube channel. Without Crime and Punishment, I wouldn't have started a podcast. Crime and Punishment was like one of those life-altering points, and it's also just a tremendous novel. It is a novel for the anxious, I would say, because Raskolnikov is the terrified and persecuted conscience personified. So if you're worried about anxiety and guilt, the possibility of redemption, can you move past your mistakes, this is the novel for you. And Dostoevsky died in 1881, and yet this book is remarkably modern. It's very much of its time. It's set in a particular time and place in Russia, and Dostoevsky sort of writes about what he knows, and yet, because he speaks to such fundamental human conditions, it's still eminently readable now, and I think because of the role of anxiety and of guilt in this story, that's what makes it speak to so many modern readers as well. The last book I will mention from 2018 is 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami. Now, I have a story about this book that really makes it very special to me. In the summer of 2018, uh, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, we decided we wanted to visit Asia together. And one of the reasons we wanted to visit was so that I could meet her parents. And I, I knew that if I wanted to marry her, I wanted to propose, I wanted to meet her family in person first. So as grad students, we had the whole summer off, and we basically lived as cheaply as we could, and we spent a month in Asia. After we'd spent about a week in China with her family, I flew back to the States and she stayed for a little while to spend more time with her family. I took a small solo trip to Japan on the way back and I spent a couple of days in Tokyo and I read 1Q84 while I was there. I would read this on the subways, these famous Tokyo subways, which I really loved. I would read them in bars. I would read it at restaurants. I would read it before I go to bed. And this novel, which is sort of set in an alternate Tokyo, not quite our Tokyo, um, it, it gave me a kind of sense of connection to the place. I was there, and I was reading about it, and I was reading it from an author that I really love, because I love a lot of Murakami's work. And, and it was through this novel that I started to think about reading contemporary literature. So not just reading science fiction and fantasy that was coming out now, or not just reading the, the classics of literature, but also reading what sort of literary fiction was like coming from, you know, modern writers, living writers. Of course, 
Murakami blends the line. There's always a fantastical element to his stories. For me, Murakami is like a master of mood. So he is so amazing at at bringing about a kind of dreamlike atmosphere or a, giving you this sense of place and of setting, which really is good because his plots are often either very simple or almost non-existent. Things just sort of happen. Cause and effect don't seem as strong in Murakami's world. I would also say as someone who likes cats and jazz, Murakami is a natural fit. So when we get into 2019, the first book I would bring up is Circe by Madeline Miller. Miller specializes in retellings of Greek mythology. And for a long time, that was a very fraught genre for me. I always thought that if you were interested in Greek mythology, why would you want to read a retelling of it? You should just go and read the real thing. And I do think anyone who's interested in these retellings would benefit from actually going and reading the source material. But really, there's this tradition of telling and retelling these sorts of stories, and Miller is just placing herself in these traditions. She also convinced me that modern retellings of these stories can be very literary, that they can have a lot of value, that they can be beautiful, that they can speak to true human concerns. I kind of had a feeling that we had like lost our ability to retell these myths, and Miller proved me wrong. It's a book that can subvert expectations, because it's not the typical kind of retelling of a Greek myth, and yet it shows respect and reverence for the source material as well. So another book from 2019 is God Save Texas by Lawrence Wright. Now in 2019, I was going to finish my PhD, I got married, and my wife and I decided we were going to move to Texas for a job that I had been offered. And I decided I wanted to learn more about Texas before I moved there. And so I read this book by Lawrence Wright. Wright is the author responsible for some of my favorite sort of investigative nonfiction. He is a, a real master of his craft, especially his book on Scientology, Going Clear, is a truly great book in my opinion. But this is not so much investigative journalism. It's a bit more narrative. It's a collection of essays all about the Lone Star State. And Wright is concerned with its complicated and sometimes sort of paradoxical past, its very uncertain present, and then this potential future, this future that actually has a lot of different directions it could go in, some of which could be really amazing. Wright is often critical of Texas, but he also deeply loves his home state. And I've lived in Texas for four years now, which is not that long, but honestly, I don't know if I ever want to leave Texas. And I feel like I can kind of share in the joy and love that Wright has for this place. So in 2019, I also read a book called After Virtue by Alistair McIntyre. This was the first work of philosophy I read after finishing my PhD. Now, when I finished my PhD and I left academia, I had a bit of resentment. You know, I chose to leave mostly for economic reasons. I didn't think the job market looked good enough. I had gotten a good job offer outside of the academy. And so I took it. But I had a lot of resentment about the, the profession, and I, I, to this day, have a lot of criticism of the university system, where I don't think it's actually delivering as much value for students as it claims it does. It's charging too much. Anyway, this is not a place for me to just list my grievances with academia. But some of my criticisms of the academic system had kind of bled over into this subject matter that I had once loved. But then I read After Virtue, and my, my love was rekindled. I, I, I don't know, it, it was the book that kind of brought me back from the brink, and it made me realize that philosophy was something I could never stop loving. It's historically informed, it's rigorous, though it is written in a way that a lot of people find a bit confusing, and it's also a book that is discussing critical issues in philosophy about morality, about tradition, about virtue, and he's not giving those easy expected answers. Alistair McIntyre is like the ultimate nonpartisan in these traditional debates. He has found his own way, and I find it to be a very compelling way. Now, 2020 was my most productive year of reading ever, and there's probably a good reason for that. There was a brief period of time where I was furloughed because of the pandemic. We were inside a lot because of the pandemic. We all wanted to escape from some things because of the pandemic, so I was just found myself reading a lot. And one of the books that I read in 2020 was The Confessions by St. Augustine. This is a really important work for me. You know, I don't talk about religion on this channel very often. Um, I can just say that Augustine is kind of a foundational thinker in my head. And it's also an important work for anyone kind of interested in Christian theology, but also interested in medieval philosophy. Augustine is sometimes called like the first medieval philosopher. It was also important sort of autobiographically because before I did YouTube, before I did any other stuff, I tried making podcasts, and I had a podcast once where I did a chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of Augustine's Confessions. The production was rough. I don't think it was that good. I don't think any copies of that podcast still exist, 
but it sort of was that necessary practice I needed for stuff that I do on this channel, stuff I do in my newsletter, stuff I do in a podcast now. Augustine's Confessions was like the opportunity for me to try that out and to see that it was something that I liked doing and I wanted to keep trying. It's also just an inspirational work. Uh, there are kind of existential concerns. Augustine is searching for meaning and he eventually finds it. Uh, but I don't think you need to be religious to enjoy it. He is speaking to these perennial concerns and then also just has interesting reflections on like the nature of time or what is eternity in the later parts of the confessions. So for the philosophically minded, I think anyone could get something from it. In the fall of 2020, I read Anathem by Neil Stevenson and that book blew me away. That was one of those books that I was reading in the middle of the night. I, I, had, I read it on Kindle. I would almost like wake up my wife sometimes because the light would be too bright from the screen and she would notice it because it'd be 4 a.m. and I would still be reading. I just could not put that book down. This is great science fiction. This is well done philosophy. This is interesting scientific speculation. This is fantastic world building. This is art. You know, I've read other Stevenson since reading Anathem, and I think it's good. I like Stevenson. I don't see any reason to skip a book that he writes, but Anathem is just such a high bar, and I don't know if he'll ever meet it in my mind. I love this book so much. In fact, I don't talk about this on the channel basically ever, but I've been trying to like write a novel for like two years now, and I think the person who kind of gave me the push to really try it was Stevenson. You know, maybe without Le Guin, it wouldn't have happened either, but it was like Le Guin showed me that philosophy and literature can go together, and Stevenson showed me that it was still being done and being done in these like really captivating ways, and that kind of inspired me to give it a shot. I don't know if my writing will ever make it to print, but I just love trying, and I thank Neil Stevenson in this book in particular for kind of inspiring me. The next book I want to talk about is Piranesi by Susanna Clarke, which I read on the day that it came out in 2020. I've done a video before about uh, great books you can read in a day, and I mentioned this was one of the few books on that list that I actually did read in a day. A fantastic novel, and, and just like Jonathan Strange, everything about that book has stuck with me. I remember it so vividly. When I was prepping for this video, I was flipping through some of the books I wanted to talk about, and I realized I have remembered almost everything from Piranesi, and it's been two years now, going on two and a half or something, and yet I can still remember so much of it. Clark just writes in such an evocative way, and she writes in a way that just has stuck with me so much, so it feels like Susanna Clark is shaping my imagination even without me realizing it. Now, there's one series I have to mention if I talk about books that I read in 2021. That's because I read every book in that series in that year, and that's The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. Uh, Brandon Sanderson helped write the final books after Jordan passed. This is my favorite fantasy series. I am just so in love with the world building here. And again, as someone who's trying to write fiction as well as do all this other stuff, seeing someone who's so steeped in the various myths and legends from around the world and is able to create this new world to tell his story in is, is so inspiring. I love especially uh, the sort of political realities that Jordan is able to craft. He has factions, he has nations, he has organizations. All of them have their own histories and they're complicated and that affects how they deal with each other or even deal with themselves in a way that really does feel plausible. Sometimes in fantasy or science fiction, it feels like the factions that are created are basically built from kind of generic molds in order to play a role in the story. But Jordan first builds them out as if they were populated by human beings. And that sounds like such an obvious thing to do, but so many authors fall short of it. And so it's worth just praising it when you see it. I'm going to talk about one more religious text, and that's a book that I read at the end of, the tw of 2021 and into 2022. It's The Orthodox Way by Callistos Ware. Now look, I am not here to convert anybody. I am not here to even talk about uh, my religion. But if I'm giving you a list of books that sort of tell the story of my life over the past couple of years, I couldn't leave this out and still be honest. Callistos Ware was a uh, English Orthodox, he was an Orthodox bishop from England, and he wrote this book that's kind of an introduction to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. And I read it, and I just found everything that I read so compelling. It was this kind of fusion of the spiritual and the intellectual, and it was this kind of vision of a whole organic human life. Now, for another book that I read in 2022 that has been so impactful on me, and that is The Intellectual Life by A.G. Sertionge. This is a book that is kind of a manual for the intellectual life, but it's also a theory of what the intellectual life 
is. This is a book that is both practical on how to read better, how to take better notes, how to just write better essays or books, and also a sort of thought about what is the intellectual life? What is its purpose? What is its point? And what are the things that you need to value or need to discard in order to live a proper intellectual life? This is the book I wish I had read years ago. If you are a college student and you are serious about your studies, read The Intellectual Life. And if you are a graduate student, especially in the humanities, read The Intellectual Life. You will benefit from it. I don't know a single person who has read this book and didn't like it. And the last book I want to highlight is We by Yevgeny Zemyatin, and I read this book last week. I love this book, but I'm not going to talk too much about it. See, I'm planning a longer video uh, about this book and the history of dystopian literature and the philosophy behind it all. But I wanted to highlight this book because it's it's such a great example of what YouTube has done to my life. You see, I was posting videos that sometimes mention science fiction, and I noticed in multiple comment sections, people were like, you got to read We by Yevgeny Zemyatin. And I was like, okay, finally I'll read it. So I read it because of YouTube, and I realized it was so good and so interesting, and that I had things I wanted to say about it, that I started scripting a video for it. Hopefully that video will be out in February, but we'll see. It's just, this one's a lot of work. It's this great example of the positive benefits that engaging this kind of content creation has had for me. I am learning about great books, and then I get to turn around and try to share them with the world so that more people can read them. And it's just such an honor and a privilege to do that. I would love to hear down in the comments about the books that have really been formative for you. What are those? Maybe in the last five years, let me know because I'm always looking for book recommendations from my viewers. All right, that's all I have for you right now. So until next time, Take care.